the Buddha's decision to go off into the forest. It started with his realization that he was subject to aging, illness, and death. The things that he, the things in which he'd been searching for happiness, were also subject to aging, illness, and death. And he wanted a happiness that was better than that, something that was more reliable. That desire was what underlay all of his efforts. To find a happiness that wouldn't age, wouldn't grow ill, and wouldn't die. Of course, all of his friends and his family told him that was impossible. But he decided that life wouldn't be worth living unless he gave it a try. And so he worked hard for six years, going down some dead-end paths, finding himself in blind alleys. But finally he found a path that led to a happiness that didn't grow ill and didn't age, didn't die. And that's what he taught for the rest of his life. It was his first teaching, Eightfold Noble Path. It was one of his last teachings as well. And prominent in the path is right effort, the kind of effort that does lead to the kind of happiness that he'd been looking for. And it starts with desire. As I say, generating desire, upholding, upholding your intent to let go of skillf unskillful qualities that have arisen, to prevent unskillful qualities that haven't arisen from arising, to give rise to skillful qualities and to maintain them and bring them to their culmination. It's the desire that animates that activity. Notice that it's an internal activity. Those qualities are qualities in the mind. They will manifest themselves outside in your thoughts, words, and deeds. But they come from within, and so that's where the main effort is focused. This is why in the section of the Noble Eightfold Path that deals with concentration, it starts with right effort. To give rise to skillful qualities like mindfulness, alertness, discernment, because these are the things that are really going to help you. Even if you don't make it all the way to nirvana, there are qualities that are really going to help you as the body ages, as it grows ill, and as it dies. That's one of the discoveries the Buddha made on the night of his awakening, was that things don't end with death. There's a carryover. And it's not the body that carries over. It's qualities of the mind. We call these things noble treasures. It's like conviction and the principle of action, that what you do, all your intentional actions, will bear fruit in line with the quality of the intention. Virtue, a sense of shame at the idea of doing evil things, a sense of fear of the consequences of doing evil things, a desire for learning, ability to relinquish what gets in the way of your path. And discernment. These things are all called noble treasures, because as the Buddha said, fire can't burn them, thieves can't steal them. Well, in his list of thieves, he includes kings as well. Thieves and kings can't steal them. Water can't wash them away. So there's that realization that death isn't the end. But you have to focus your energies on the mind if you want to have something to carry over, if you want to have good things to carry over. Otherwise, you carry over bad things. It's 
So our effort here is aimed in two directions. One, if you can gain total release, this is the path to total release. If you don't gain it within this lifetime, well, you've got good things to carry over as you continue your quest in your next lifetime. But you have to desire those qualities, otherwise it's hard to, hard to work at them, because they do require work. We like the idea that there's a path that, require, that doesn't require any action at all, but it doesn't work that way. The path of inaction just goes in the general way that water goes, just goes downhill. Of course, this path requires effort. It's right effort. It doesn't require that you have to kill yourself or exhaust yourself, but it does require an appropriate effort, whatever is required to get past unskillful qualities and give rise to skillful ones. There are times when it requires a lot of concerted effort, other times when it requires just the ability to sit and watch. But it's a focused effort, it's an appropriate effort for whatever the situation demands. And it's built on that desire to find something that goes beyond aging, illness, and death, something you can really rely on. And so an important element in the practice is generating that desire. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us look at aging, illness, and death, and look at our fear of aging, illness, and death. He says that our fear of death is based on four things. Either we're attached to the body, we're attached to sensual pleasures, we realize that we've done cruel and horrible things to other people, or we really haven't seen the true Dharma, that there really is a deathless. And so a lot of meditation is aimed at overcoming those four reasons for fear. For example, realization that we've done cruel things in the past. The Buddha doesn't have us get tied up in remorse, even with the principle of karma, which sometimes sounds deterministic. He says you have to realize that it's a very complex process, and one of the things that you can do to counteract any harmful things you've done in the past is to develop an attitude of goodwill for all beings without limit. He said it's like an expansive mind state. And when painful things happen in an expansive mind state, the impact is much different from things happening in a very narrow and confined mind state. The image he gives of the, a rock crystal, excuse me, a salt crystal. You can put it in a glass of water and the water becomes unfit to drink. You can put it in an enormous river and the water in the river is still fit to drink because there is so much more water compared to the salt. So he recommends that you develop an attitude of goodwill for all beings. Whether you like them or not, you have to decide that you don't want to cause them suffering. You don't want to take pleasure in their suffering. And as you think about it, you know, what good do you get out of other people's suffering? You don't get anything at all. There may be a sense of schadenfreude, but that's pretty miserable food when you think about it. And you realize that if all the cruel and heartless people in the world had a true sense of happiness, they wouldn't do cruel and heartless things anymore. So the desire for goodwill is an important way of wishing that the world would be a better place. And it gets you your attitude right on how the world would become a better place. and also puts you in a position where your true happiness doesn't have to conflict with the true happiness of other people. So this is one way of counteracting that particular reason for fear. 
as for atta attachment to the body and attachment to sensual pleasures, the Buddha has a double-pronged attack. One is to see the drawbacks of being attached to these things. If you're attached to the body, where is it going to take you? It's going to take you to aging, illness, and death. For sure, it may take you to other places in the meantime, but the ultimate end is something we all share. And we all know for sure that's going to happen. The same holds true for sensual pleasures. Where are the sensual pleasures you were enjoy enjoying last week? Right now all you have is a memory of them. And sometimes that memory is tainted by the realization that you did unskillful things in order to gain those pleasures. And many times when you gain a pleasure, other people will want what you've got, and they're going to fight you for it. The image the Buddha has is of a bird, like a hawk, that's found a little lump of meat. As soon as it tries to carry it off, other birds are going to come and attack it. Or of a man sitting up in a tree of fruit, enjoying the fruit in the tree, but another man comes along, he's got a hatchet, and he, instead of climbing up in the tree, he's going to cut the tree down. Finding your happiness in sensual pleasures leads you in a position of a lot of danger. This is why the Buddha recommends right concentration as a source for happiness, because you can sit here and then bathe the body in a sense of ease and a sense of rapture simply by focusing on the breath, adjusting the breath so that it's comfortable, and then once it really feels good, just settling in. That letting the breath bathe you in all directions, coming in and out all the pores of the body, allowing that sense of ease and rapture to fill the whole body. As you get really adept at this, you find that your attachment to sensual pleasures begins to loosen, because you see that this is a much better pleasure. It's more intense, it's more pervasive, more reliable, less blameworthy, and a lot less dangerous. So right concentration is, in a very direct way, one of the ways of overcoming fear of death, because you realize you have an alternative source of pleasure here. But the ultimate step lies in, as the Buddha says, seeing the true Dharma, which means realizing that there is something deathless that can be touched by the mind. And that comes not just through concentration, but also working on the insight. Or the opportunities for insight that the concentration provides. As the mind gets more and more still, you can begin to see the mind's attachments. You can see them as activities. Even its sense of itself, or your sense of yourself, you begin to realize that these are all just strategies that you've created. You, the Buddha calls it a process of I-making and my-making. In whatever way you form a sense of self around form or feelings or perceptions, thought constructs, or consciousness. It's all just fabrication. And in the process of fabrication, there's stress. And if that's all there were in life, then you'd be willing to put up with the stress. But the Buddha says there's more. If you can learn how to deconstruct all these fabrications, all the stories and ideas and things that you build around your sense of who you are and who other people are and what the world is. If you can learn to deconstruct those things, and that's what right mindfulness and right concentration are about. Providing you with a framework in which you can do the deconstruction. And the deconstruction is Four Noble Truths, just looking at things in terms of stress and the cause of stress, what you're doing to put an end to that cause and the actual end of stress that comes as you get more and more precise and more and more skilled at following the path. It let, leads you to detect even more more subtle levels of fabrication going on in the mind. When you see the stress that comes with it, and see that you also have the choice not to fabricate. That 
whatever gratification you got from the from the fabrication just can't compare with a sense of ease that comes from dropping that particular level of fabrication. The mind would be willing to let go, willing to stop. And peels these levels of fabrication away, like peeling away the levels of the layers in an onion. And when all intention finally ends, that's when you realize, okay, there is something deathless. The Buddha was right. There's something that can be touched in the mind that doesn't require fabrication. In fact, it is totally unfabricated. It has nothing to do with time or space or anything that can die or age, grow ill, or die at all. It's just there. And it can be touched by undoing the patterns of intention and fabrication in the mind. Once you've touched that, then you realize, okay, there is there's something that doesn't die. It has nothing to do with you, all those through your activities and intentions skillful intentions that took apart your other intentions that got you to the point where you could realize this. But because there's no need to strategize in there, there's no, there's no self that comes with the felt need to strategize or the felt need to partake of this. It's just there. You don't need to partake of it. Once you've seen that, that's what really gets you beyond fear of death. Because the part that doesn't die is much more worthwhile than the things that do die. Now, at the moment, all of this is just ideas, of possibilities. For people who are still pursuing it, but it's important to have a sense of what's possible. Because that expands your imagination. As your imagination gets expanded, then your desires change as well. If you think the deathless is impossible, okay, your desires are going to focus on things that can die. If you open up to the possibility that there is a deathless that can, can be attained through human effort, it's a challenge. Hopefully it stirs some desire in the mind to follow the path to test if what the Buddha said is really true. So keep this possibility in mind, because that is what gives energy to the desire to stick with right effort, to stick with the path. So it's not just ideas or news of somebody else's claims. So ultimately, it ultimately does become an actual experience based on your actual efforts. It's not just news about what somebody did in the past. It becomes your news. Of course, nobody else has to know. As the chant says, it's bachatang. It's something that each person can experience only for him or herself. But when it becomes a reality in your mind, it makes a huge change. Aging, illness, and death don't hold any fear. As one of the texts says, you attain something that allows you to live in peace and ease, and even bliss, even when you're old, even when you're sick, even when you die. Now that's a possibility that's really worth exploring.